good day, everyone, and welcome to Careers, Life, in Yale, Must See Yaley Show. Uh, the topic for tonight's show is global entrepreneurship with author and businesswoman Linda Rotenberg, Yale Law School Class of 1993. Uh, my name is Orlando Yarba III, uh, Yale Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, Class of 2010, and I am on the Yale Alumni Board of Governors. Uh, Yvette Rivers and I are the new co-chairs for the Careers Life in Yale Committee, and we welcome uh, everyone joining us, alumni as well as current students, friends. For those of you who are new to our series, this is our fall series of Careers Life in Yale weekly virtual shows uh, that all facilitate the sharing of wisdom from alumni to alumni and between alumni and students, uh, all aim to help with career decisions, life decisions, and transitions. Uh, we're so glad you can make it tonight, and we invite you to come back anytime for any of our weekly programs. And also feel free to reach out to us if you have any ideas or recommendations for other uh, inspiring Yaleys we could invite on our show. And I will put my email address in the chat. Um, please feel free to email me and let me know your recommendations. Um, a few notes uh, before we get started with our program. Uh, we are recording the show, and this recording will be available on the YAA's Venmo channel. Uh, if you want to watch it again or if you want to share it, please stay muted. Um, I also want to thank the YAA staff that have helped to put this program together. Steve Bloom, Chelsea Gladeau, and Kate Gustafson. Um, I thank our Yale Board of Governors uh, executive member and our point person, Jeff Feldman. Uh, thank other members of the Careers Life in Yale team. Uh, finally, uh, if you haven't already, I strongly encourage you to join the YAA's Cross Campus. It's an online community, uh, 24,000 plus Yaleys. It's sort of like a LinkedIn for Yaleys, uh, both alumni and students. And it's an opportunity to network with pre-vetted Yaleys and a great way to connect uh, is crosscampus.yale.edu. Okay, tonight we are so excited to hear about Linda Rotenberg's professional and personal journey as a global entrepreneur. Named Innovator for the 21st Century by Time, America's Best Leader by U.S. News and the Entrepreneur Whisper by ABC, Fox, NPR, Linda has led the global entrepreneurship movement for two decades and counting. Uh, we'll hear about Linda's global leadership experience, including her role as co-founder and CEO of Endeavor Global, a nonprofit that seeks to transform emerging countries by supporting high-impact entrepreneurs. For the first part of our time together, um, I will facilitate a conversation with Linda and then we'll open it up for the rest of you to ask questions uh, on screen, or you can enter a question into the chat at any time, and, and I will ask it for you if you like. First, uh, I want to introduce Linda. So Linda Rotenberg is an American businesswoman and author. She is the author of Crazy is a Compliment, The Power of Zigging When Everyone Else Zags. She is the CEO and co-founder of Endeavor, a nonprofit organization that encourages the power of entrepreneurship. She serves on the board of Zio Group, a global provider of bandwidth infrastructure. She is a member of the Inter-American Dialogue, Council on Foreign Relations, and Young Presidents Organization, and serves on the Entrepreneurship Steering Committee of the World Economic Forum. We are honored to have Linda with us. Uh, you, Linda? have kindly agreed to share with us your insights and experience. Um, if you would, please take a moment to begin uh, by introducing yourself. Uh, you can share what you like, uh, where you grew up, what were formative experiences for you back then, uh, where you were living before your time at Yale, um, and maybe you know what was your area of interest or focus when you first entered Yale Law School. Sure, well, it's nice to be part of this. Uh, 
Great. Yeah, I love that they're weekly. Uh, and I look forward to hearing the thoughts on all of your mind. It's great to be with you, Orlando, and to get to know your uh, incredible journey as well. So I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts. Uh, I went to Newton South High School, a public school outside of Boston. Uh, my parents were the first, theirs was the first generation to go to college. So I was told you got to work hard and, you know, get a, education is key. So I worked hard and went to Harvard. I was an undergrad in social studies, which is kind of like directed studies, DS at Yale, but three years instead of one. Uh, and, um, and I ended up going straight through to Yale, uh, partly because I didn't exactly know what I was, uh, was going to do. I, um, I had sort of a bifurcated path at Harvard. I ran Harvard students for Dukakis and worked for the Dukakis campaign. In fact, I just saw Josh Steiner at my husband's uh, Styles 87 reunion. Josh is on the corporate, uh, corporation board of Yale. And we met at, uh, at the Dukakis headquarters back in 1986. Wow. <laughs> but also through social studies, most many of my colleagues were international. And I arrived at Harvard right when the anti-apartheid movement was really gaining strength. And I left right after the Berlin Wall had come down. So it just seemed to me that the all of the urgency was was happening elsewhere in the world rather than the US. So I kind of came to Yale to figure it out. Oh, that is great. Thank you. Uh, this theme is globalization and uh, you are accomplishing global change. As a law school student, what were you thinking during your time at Yale as it pertains to business or entrepreneurship? What was on your mind? Well, first of all, I was thinking I got the wrong memo because I got the memo that it was like Marion Wright Edelman of the Children's Defense Fund and the Zagat founders and all these cool people. And you went to Yale Law School, so you were not interested in law. And, and suddenly all my colleagues were like interested in the law. I was like, wait a minute, you got the wrong memo. <laughs> or they wanted to become Supreme Court justices or senators. Now, actually, the joke's on me because three of my uh, various classmates in different years were, were Chris Coons, uh, Cory Booker, and and uh, Michael Bennett, who are, are all senators, yes. so yes. They, they, they got a different memo. But anyway, and um, what I would say is that back then, even before Heather Gerken, who now runs the law school, is very focused on leadership and, 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 and interdisciplinary action. But even back then, one of the things I love about Yale is how not siloed the different schools are and how interdisciplinary it was. So I was encouraged um, with my, my, my weird, unfocused uh, thoughts. So I took classes at the School of Management in organizational behavior and healthcare and nonprofit management. I took classes at the School of Environment. And in the law school, I took a class on transitions from democracy uh, to democracy, but taught by an Argentine, uh, Carlos Nino, who is famous for having rewritten the, uh, the Constitution of Argentina after the military junta and transition to democracy. And it was because of that that my life changed. And Owen Fiss, who actually taught con law, so I'd been avoiding his class, <laughs> found me and said, you know what, I know you're interested in Latin America and I need some help because we have this uh, program in Chile we're trying to do and start this law and policy review. Will you go there this summer? And, and then we'll figure it out. Maybe you can work with Carlos um, over, over, over Yale. So just to finish the story, um, I, my parents reminded me, Linda, you don't have a trust fund. You actually have to need, need a job. <laughs> <laughs> but I, what happened was the day I was supposed to come back from Santiago, Chile to home, I got an emergency call from, Owen, from Professor Fish saying that to rewrite my, reroute my plane to Argentina because Carlos Nino had been invited by the president of Bolivia to rewrite their constitutional pause, had a heart attack in the airport because of the altitude and died. And I needed to go to the funeral. And then I was actually hired by Yale to work for two years to, to pursue Nino's dream and created the first interdisciplinary law and business school in the country. So that was my, yeah. I didn't come in with that, but that's, well, that's where I ended up. <laughs> yes. So were you a student at that time or was this after you graduated? Well, this was right when I was graduated. So basically I was the only one. It's very funny because everyone tell my, my, one of my uh, classmates is Van Jones, who now everyone knows on CNN. Everyone thinks he was the coolest. And I was like, but Van, you actually got a job in the law. I was really the one without the, <laughs> the job. <laughs> So they, the professors actually took pity on me and they knew I was interested in Latin America. They were like, Linda, come work for me. And actually it was very funny because years later when Endeavor was started, 
I went back to the law school and someone came up to me and said, wait a minute, are you, are you Linda Rotenberg? And I said, yes. And they said, well, you know, you're famous here. And I thought, wow, you know, Endeavor's not that old. How do you know? And it turns out they said, no, 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 no. So this was before AOL really was taking off and certainly years before Google. So my job at Yale was to go negotiate for this interdisciplinary law and business school with all the Argentines and report back to Owen Fiss and Bo Bird at Yale. And so apparently I was famous for racking up the highest phone bills in the history of Yale Law School. <laughs> That's my claim to fame. Oh, that's wonderful. That is wonderful. How, given that opportunity that you had, what were the steps that you took? Were, were you thinking about entrepreneurship then? Were you thinking about uh, being in Argentina? What, yeah. Well, one of the reasons why I'm so active in Yale now, having, you know, my husband's a Yaley, but I went to Harvard, but I went to Yale, the law school, and why am I, but I'm on the President's Council for International Affairs. Why am I so passionate about Yale? Well, because they, it changed my life in multiple ways. So first it gave me this opportunity when I didn't, I was this clueless student, didn't know what I was gonna do. Then I got sent to Latin America. Then when I wanted to stay, the law school, the, the interdisciplinary business and law school was done. The gringa had, it was time for me to go home. But um, but people actually somewhat, Ted Marmer, who I taught, took a school at the school, a class with the School of Management, told me about this uh, Yale Law grad named um, Bill Drayton, who had won a McKinsey, uh, I'm in a MacArthur Fellowship after working at McKinsey to start Ashoka, which was the first kind of venture firm for social entrepreneurs. So I ended up spending two years at Ashoka, helping these nonprofit leaders start these uh, these innovative ideas. And now I'm living in Latin America. It's Yahoo. It's Netscape. Steve's job is back in at Apple. And I'm like, why are none of you starting a business? Like, come on, where are the entrepreneurs? And, and I was in a taxi and my taxi driver has an engineering degree and tells me he's driving a taxi because there's no way he can get a job. And I was like, wait a minute, what's the word for? And I couldn't think of the word for entrepreneur in Spanish and I knew it wasn't empresario. And he says to me, I'm sorry, there's no word for that here. If you don't come from the top 10 families, you can't get a job. So I was like, this is ridiculous. So I went back to Bill Drayton, the founder of Ashoka. I said, we need a Ashoka for the private sector. And he said, no. I'm no, I, we're doing it for the nonprofit leaders. I said, well, then I need to go leave and start this with your blessing. Yeah. And I had met up with this kid named Peter Kellner, who was also thinking this crazy, crazy idea of entrepreneurs in emerging markets. And that is how the idea for Endeavor was born. And the coda to this story is one of my favorite moments of Endeavor came five years later. We were, we were then in Argentina, Chile, and Brazil. We're now in 41 markets worldwide. And the editor of the Portuguese Brazilian dictionary called up our managing director and said, in part because of Endeavor's work, they were adding the words empreendedor and empreendedorismo into the lexicons. So now I go looking for that taxi driver who now can, you know, yes. can be hired by a company. Yes. Uh, please tell us more about Endeavor and what you sought to do when you first started it. And how do you see it now fulfilling those dreams or yes? Yeah, well, it's hard to... It's hard to think back, but 1997, it was a kind of a period, a tumultuous period like we're in now, right? So the Thai bot had collapsed, emerging markets were collapsing. So this idea of there being entrepreneurs in emerging markets, let alone ones that could actually attract any venture capital, seemed outrageous. So uh, you mentioned my book, Crazy, as a compliment. I was called crazy. And so I sort of believe that if you're, start, if you're starting something new and you're not called crazy, then you're probably not thinking big enough. So that's my... <laughs> Uh, thought. Um, we always thought, you know, there's entrepreneurship in emerging markets worldwide, and today we're in 40 mark, 41 markets, including some underserved um, markets here in the United States and all over across Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, Europe, and uh, the Middle East. And uh, and our entrepreneurs, we now have, you know, 68 unicorns, billion dollar plus companies coming from these markets. Often they were the first tech company in these markets. And what's been exciting is we believe they would also pay it forward. And that's what we're seeing. One of the things Endeavor is tracking is not only the individual success stories, but how they pay it forward back into the ecosystem by mentoring and reinvesting in and inspiring and training that next generation. And you sort of see these ecosystems build and that's what we're mapping out. Yes. Um, I wanna ask you about pivot points and your personal ones and, um, and for all of you who are on, I had the opportunity to go to the Endeavor website. And one of the things I appreciate are the entrepreneur stories 
Mm-hmm. And in their stories, I see a lot of pivot points where something shifted for them. Yeah. And their business really blew up and, and, and their dreams were realized in a way that um, some of them never thought they would be realized or in a way that they always dreamed. Um, yeah. And for you in your life, in reflecting on your life and career so far, uh, which includes co-founding and leading as CEO of Endeavor Global, what were key pivot points? Um, how did you navigate them? Or, you know, did they navigate you? What was it like? <laughs> yeah, a little of both. Um, well, let's talk, I'll talk about the world and then I'll, and then I'll talk about personal. But I think uh, in the world, we did have a number of pivot points. So one was when, you know, you mentioned Endeavor as a nonprofit, but we are supporting these high growth entrepreneurs. And I always had the idea that we were going to be sustained based on the success of our entrepreneurs. And no one thought this would ever happen. Um, But we were building these ecosystems. There were no venture capital, you know, the the, the, the venture capitalists investing in these markets. And because of the Endeavor seal of approval, they started coming. So around 2011, Reid Hoffman, who founded LinkedIn, who's a member of my board, sort of said, okay, Linda, now it's time. Now we can invest in a rules-based way. So we're not crowding out the the, the VC, but we can become self-sustaining. And so Endeavor started our Endeavor Catalyst funds and we just raised our fourth fund. We have now $500 million on assets under management. And this will make Endeavor fully self-sustaining. So the way we operate is instead of a traditional venture model where the limited partners get their principal back and 80% of the profits and 20% go to a few kind of managing partners. Instead, it's a 50-50 model where any investor gets their principal back and 50% of the profits and 50% go to scale the nonprofit. So 50% of the profits go to make Endeavor, the nonprofit around the world, self-sustaining, which is so cool. And now we have our entrepreneurs that are the board members that are re- that are the investor. A third of our funds come from Endeavor entrepreneurs. So that that's really exciting. And that's now my my goal is to become one of the first nonprofits to become in completely self-sustaining because that's very rare. Um, the other thing that happened was after the 2008 cr- crisis here, I got calls first from Greece and then from the U.S. saying, hey, we need this, you know. So I started joking that instead of in, in emerging markets, we'd go to submerging markets. <laughs> but but once we started, um, so we're we're now we're in Greece and Italy and 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 um, and Japan and some places we wouldn't have gone. And then in the U.S., we have offices in you know, in Detroit and Buffalo and uh, Denver and Miami and Atlanta and Louisville, where we felt there were sort of underserved, you know, founders still with global ambition. So those I never would have predicted those two things. Um, And then the last thing I'll say is on a personal level, um, you know, when I, I have identical twin daughters, they're 17 now, but they're, when they were young, I sort of thought, okay, well, now I'm a mom and I'm a female, you know, leader. I've got to like appear really strong and, you know, like I have everything together because otherwise people will not want to follow. That was my sense. And then when my, when my girls were three, Bruce, my husband, who is who is styles 87, um, developed, as I mentioned, Orlando, a rare form of bone cancer. And, um, and he fortunately survived, but it was a year of intensive chemo. He replaced his entire femur with that titanium rod. And, and it was a year and I couldn't travel and I wanted to be there for Bruce and the girls. And when I came back, um, you know, people asked me how I was and I just, you know, I kind of broke down. I couldn't hide it. And what was interesting to me and the lesson I learned was that some young um, team members came up to me and they said, look, Linda, you know, we were always a little intimidated by you (laughs) and we thought you were superhuman. And now we realize, you know, you're a real person. Now we'll follow you anywhere. So the lesson that I always say is that I learned to be less super and more human. So that's my personal pivot. Yes. Just to continue with that, what were some other kind of hard leadership lessons that you learned? Well, I think what's interesting is, you know, we have five, I have 500 full-time employees in 41 markets. And um, I think the amazing thing is realizing 
that people have more commonalities than they do differences. You know, I thought, okay, well, Brazil is different than Lebanon, which is different than Nigeria, which is different than Saudi, you know, than Saudi Arabia and Indonesia and, you know, uh, Bulgaria, and we have to, everything has to be kind of customized. And I think that, um, I think the exciting thing is realizing that if you bring people towards a common vision, right? that people actually have 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 more similarities but that um that confidence that i got realizing that as long as everyone's aligned there may be some local you know nuances but people do are are more the same it allowed me to say the people who aren't with the plan for example when we started the fund a lot of even my board members were against it and said wait a minute we're this nonprofit. what do you mean we're a fund now and I actually had to, I ended up firing half my board. Because yeah. I said, you know what, if I can bring all these team members and all these entrepreneurs from all these markets and everyone is aligned and you guys are not, like you gotta kind of disagree and commit or, or you know, or or this isn't the right fit. That was really hard, but that, um, yeah. Oh, um, I have some more questions uh, and uh, those who are on, you know, feel free to, <laughs> Put your questions in the chat, and I can I, read I have them to for you. Pop in on that something. You yes, just please. Said, yeah. Firing your board. <laughs> I yeah, exactly. I want to. I want to hear about firing the board. That's exactly right. Um, I I serve. Uh, I can't remember we talked about it. I serve uh, on the board of a small public company, and I also chair our governance nominating compensating committee. Uh huh. And, uh, oh yeah, I'm with you. I, I chair one of those too. <laughs> so yeah, so I I'm all over that. I. It, it riff on that for a minute, if you don't mind, and, and talk about like why and how you accomplish that. Yeah, look, I'm on, I'm actually now, I've been on three public company boards. So I think in some ways, in some ways it's harder, but I think you can do the same thing, even on the public company board. And I've, 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 I've sort of had people eased out as well on, on those. I, look, I, what I said was, what we're doing is hard. We're helping these entrepreneurs you know, in these places where people aren't used to fund, like I just gave a talk as our landowners, as you know, uh, to Silicon Valley last week at the Masters of Scale Summit on the rise of unicorns, billion dollar companies in the rest of the world. Okay. I thought this was pretty obvious and I knew I had some cool data to add. No, this was like shocking and not outside of China, you know, that so, wait a minute, you're talking about, you know, Nigeria and Mexico and the Philippines, like, what are you talking about? And so they have no, so I think that there is so much difficulty. And if you're a public company, if you're a startup, what you're trying to do is so hard that the friction should be outside, not inside. And that's what I said. I said, if we're you know, if we all can't even agree on kind of the mission stuff, like it's different and we were doing well. I was like, it would have been one thing if we weren't meeting our numbers or we weren't, or right, or the board was complaining about certain things. But I was like, this is so obvious. The entrepreneurs love this in our case. So, and but if you're not really aligned with the mission, and I think this is true in a public company or in a nonprofit setting, if you're ultimately creating more friction when you have to, so much is so difficult, then why are you part of the organization? And it's different than not being a yes person, right? It's different than asking tough questions. I love board members who ask tough questions out of a, you know, but, but are basically bought into the premise. So I actually have helped entrepreneurs, even in my, um, my entrepreneurs, you know, get rid of their boards or if, or if they're um, having challenges with investors. Ha buy out their buy out their investors. I think sometimes you need to do that. I'd be curious, Jeffrey, as, as a serial entrepreneur, if you've had to do this. It's just, yeah, life is too hard. I'll just go yeah. proud because you uh, you don't mind. Uh, go ahead. Mention it. My background. So I was. Uh, I've got a technical background in material science. I had a PhD before I went to Yale. Then I went to uh, school of management. Yeah. And I was in venture capital from there. So a lot of that you know, became entrepreneur and I've done various mm -hmm. deals on you know, the public side, private side, um, done venture, done distress and all that sort of thing. And, and when you say it really resonates quite a bit because with the fundamental approach I take is deal in real. And, uh, you know, anyone can kind of manage a sunny day. It's really the folks that can manage the rainy days that you're counting on. I do a lot of the entrepreneurs at Yale. I coach a lot of entrepreneurs and all that. And, and it, that's, to me, that's the, the heart of the matter is trying to be there and, and understand how to uh, plan, uh, understand where you are on the, on the, on the 
playing field, making adjustments as you go. Uh, in the company that I had, you know, I raised 100 million bucks in venture during the day, built up, you know, like 250 people. Then I had to go down to like 40 people. You know, yeah. Hard to say. yeah, it's hard. You have to make hard but decisions. You got to deal in real. I mean, right. Real key you, it, you have to be willing to make the hard decisions, but you can't have people breathing down your neck who don't even agree with the basic premise. And that's whether exactly. it's a venture person or a board member at a nonprofit. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So, I agree Orlando, back to you. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> no, this is great. And others, uh, Put questions in the chat, or you can, you know, raise your hand and um, unmute and, and talk. Um, I want to ask a question about being a, a pioneer, mm -hmm. and the and my question is about how you how you understand yourself and what you're doing, mm -hmm. um, because to be a pioneer, sometimes there'll be people with you. Um, sometimes the people who go with you will go with you some of the distance, sometimes they'll go with you all of the distance, but to be a person who pioneers something and is willing to move forward. Yeah. Um, and what I hear you describing are things that were against the grain of what was thought to be a successful move. Yeah. Uh, so to do something out of the box, to pioneer it, what are the conversations you've had with yourself? Uh, what are the things that you think you you believed or had to change about what you believed in terms of, you know, who you are and how you're doing this? Well, I, you know, I never wanted the safe, steady, even though I knew I didn't, I had nothing to fall back on, but yet I knew that was not for me. My parents were like, okay, you don't like law, how about Goldman Sachs? I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> it's not happening. Uh, I said, I said it's the Gat, Marion Wright Edelman, not Bob Rubin. That's not the memo. <laughs> That's not the Yale memo. So, yeah. um, so, but I think that, but I always knew that this unsafe path, but like that was calling me. And I think with the entrepreneurs, I, I work with entrepreneurs, you know, in so many markets, right? In so many different cultures and that they see, and I'm so authentically kind of like them that that's where it resonates. And I think what's, what's been exciting, and I will say coming to the US, I was like, ah, why are we in the US? Is it, it doesn't even need us. But when actually it's be another, one of my, one of my uh, close friends now, who's an Endeavor entrepreneur, who was also a Yale Law graduate, um, is Song Laurent, who found it, who left the law to start Squire, um, Squire Technologies. And basically he and his uh, co-founder Dave Salvan um, are digitizing all of the mom and pop barbershops barbershops across the uh, the country. Uh, they are like very near unicorn valuation. But, and he said to me, he said, you know, it was as a black tech founder, he's like, there weren't that many, there weren't that many people who were role models. And he said, Endeavor is the first peer group I have of people who've been outside the country, but their their realities are so much more like mine. And they, you know, they've gone to Dubai, David and, and Greece and Brazil. And they're like, this is, this is our community. And so it's been really fun for me to develop this community of like-minded individuals who, yes, are trying something hard. But the other thing I would say about entrepreneurs, particularly in emerging markets, is they're not creating the next cool new super app. No, they're really solving real world problems at scale. So we're talking about some of the health tech companies earlier, right? FinTech is really about financial inclusion for people who didn't have access to credit. Or, or bank accounts or, you know, ed tech that you're seeing or ag tech, you know, we have one of the in Kenya, Twiga will be, uh, is the most important ag tech company that's also linking up, um, you know, all of the, all of the farmers, but these are major companies, these are all super large companies that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars eventually, but before there was no capital. And they're trying something super hard. And I don't know, that's that's to me, these are my people, right? <laughs> like if you're trying something difficult and you don't know what you're doing, that's that. So I I really created a community of my own because I couldn't get a real job, I think. I... <laughs> <laughs> well, that works. That definitely works. Um, thank you. In the chat, there's a, a question from Elijah. And Elijah, I don't know if you want to unmute and ask. I can also read it, but feel free. And actually, I don't. Oh, I saw. So he's asking about if what if what if the co-founder is technically capable but shy or immature. Yes. How do you help the technical, um, you know, person development? You know, it's it's that's a really interesting question. So we've seen two things. So in Endeavor, you have to go through an entire like six to twelve month selection process to come through our international selection panel to get selected, and we've had co-founders, very techie co-founders. Um, we're not people first choose not to be part of it because they're like the internal person, but we've really encouraged, 
um, people to come through. And I think we've actually created at different business schools, different um, executive programs, ed education and leadership programs for that group. And I think that, um, you know, putting them with peers who are similarly kind of focused, you know, helps. But I'd say there are some that just say, this isn't for me. And that's okay too. Like, I'm just not a joiner. <laughs> I'm not like my C CEO or the CEO, they can do it, but I I'm gonna go do my thing. And so we don't pressure anyone, I think, to, um, if they want to, I would say, come out of their shell and develop them, we can put them with peers. But if they don't want to, there's no pressure to either. So that's that's how I would respond. Thank you very much. What's changed about the culture around you uh, that enabled or made your work harder? And this might pertain to anywhere you are leading, whether it's Endeavor or the World Economic Forum or, or Globent. Um, anything about the culture that's helped or hindered your work? Well, weirdly, I think in some ways it helps because it's an oasis, it's a respite. I think when you turn on the news these days, it's so depressing. And, you know, if people are still on Twitter, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's scary. The world seems, the problem seems so intractable. The world seems so divided. And to be part of something where in the last two days, I've, you know, I've interviewed entrepreneurs from, you know, from Kenya and Indonesia and Uruguay and, uh, and uh, Lebanon and, you know, and, and just seeing their passion and their commitment to doing things and their commonalities. Mm -hmm. Because I said, I, I weirdly think that people feel more inclined that we've got to do good. We've got to counter those negative forces, right? And I do think that entrepreneurs see themselves as global citizens. And I think that in a world that's become more about borders and nationalism that we've seen in a long time, to be part of something where people see themselves as, as, as borderless, uh, I don't know, to me, to me, it, it, it's what keeps me going in the morning because I, I think I would otherwise, you know, sort of crawl under the covers. Yes. To follow up on that, um, over the years and over the decades, has your view of global scale leadership changed? It's been amplified. And what I would say is, you know, we always knew back then the role model effect was really important. And this is something I mentioned in my in my talk last week. You know, what I realize is that importance is is amplified even more than I thought. And I I, I liken when when one founder, whether in an underserved market or an underserved community, becomes in I'll I'll say a unicorn just for that, the you know, the billion dollar company, but just a big deal, right? And crosses that barrier. Like it was impossible. There, there'd never be that company, right, from this country. And they and they achieve that. I, I liken it to the British runner Roger Bannister, right? So before Roger Bannister running a sub four minute mile was universally considered impossible. No one on earth had done it until 1954. And Bannister, this British runner, runs a, a three minute, 59.4 second mile. And his record lasts 46 days, 46 days after centuries. And today, over 1600 runners have broken that, that barrier. And it's sort of the same thing. When one female founder, when one black founder, when one Latin American founder, when one Middle Eastern founder, when one African founder, they do this, other people say, hey, she can do it, I can too. He can do it, I can too. And so I think the power of storytelling, the power of that role model effect, and then the power of what Endeavor does, which is the paying it forward, and that it does make a difference, right? You're reinvesting, you're mentoring, it does actually make a difference in showing people. Um, I've actually become more convinced rather than pivoted in, in that belief. Yes, oh, thank you for that. Oh, I always wanna check in with those who are here. Um, any questions or comments you have Please feel free to raise your hand. Or Anything, any topic. Place something in the chat. Jeff. Yeah, that's the question. So, um, you know, in, in the stuff that you've been uh, talking about uh, here, uh, Linda, the, some of the transition from uh, being, you know, sort of close to the action in terms of the entrepreneurs themselves, it sounds like you've scaled what you've done tremendously. So, congratulations. Mm -hmm. Um, are you a little more remote from it now? I remember, you know, on, on the VC side, if you had, 
you know, four to six board seats, four to six companies, that was kind of enough, right? And that's why that business doesn't scale that well. Um, but you've obviously got this thing to another scale. So I'm just interested in how you yeah. manage that over time, what you're doing. Yeah, you know, I have a, a longtime colleague who run, who manages the kind of co-investment fund, and I have um, sort of president on the nonprofits, and so I can I can do both. But here's the thing, which is interesting. I spend an hour Zooming with every single entrepreneur who comes to our selection process. And this is the one thing I won't give up. My assistant is like, what the hell are you doing? You're Zooming at like, it's 10 p.m. It must be the Philippines. You're waking up, you know, or in Vietnam. And then you're waking up and what are you doing? And yet I have to say, I was very emotional this week. I went I, I went to MIT Sloan and um, we had 20 years ago started with um, the, the folks there to do a G-Lab, a global e a global e-lab program where they have um, sets of three to four students working with global companies. They've done this famously at Route 128 and we helped them and other people doing it globally. And I went back, I hadn't been in years and I didn't know anything about any of the projects. And it turned out there were, uh, there were groups of three to four students, 19 projects, 12 of which were Endeavor entrepreneurs. Hmm. And I went and and someone says, okay, well, I'm working for Aruna. I was like, oh, that's the Indonesian e-fisheries company. Oh, Max. Oh, that's the Nigerian, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, Uber mobility company. And they're expanding into the, into the rest of, you know, sub-Saharan Africa and went down. And I, because I still met people, I knew every company. I, I walked out of there and I said, you know what? I will never stop. The day I stop meeting every entrepreneur who walks in, I can then I should quit because if you're too remote, then really, how right. can you lead, right? That's my view. Good, that's great, thanks. Linda, what, what is it like to work with leaders, world leaders on big things? Um, and where do you have, or where can we find hope in some of our global and local challenges? Well, look, I think one of the things, and again, one of the things that I'm most proud of being affiliated with with Yale is that I think that not only people become too siloed, but I think that thinking has become too siloed. And I think all of this STEM, and look, I have a lot of you know colleagues and friends in Silicon Valley, but this whole STEM focus, I think has removed this need for interdisciplinary and liberal arts thinking and cross-cultural and and I think that what has been so clear to me and what Yale does so well is you know back to the school of management interacting with the school of public health interacting with the law school interacting with the school of the environment and architecture I feel like leaders today need to be much more well versed in a lot of these issues they also need psychology right for all of the employees and the and the psychological issues that can no longer be just pushed to the side, deal with it on your own time. As leaders, you have to be, you know, versed in that. So I feel like the things are so much more complex. And if we've only grown up learning one thing, we're gonna really miss out. So again, we need more more Yales <laughs> and less kind of like you know narrow narrow focus. And I think we've got to do lifelong learning because we're all not equipped to deal with the new challenges, the new generations, the new kind of issues that come up. And I think we have to remind ourselves that we have to keep learning and, and, and growing. Yeah. Did the pandemic in any particular way open up new avenues of entrepreneurship or how people collaborate um, either through Endeavor or yeah. just other places that you saw? It did. And that's a really interesting question. And I would say that we talk about this a lot because, you know, we talk about the loss of like office culture, right? Mm -hmm. And in my own experience, so we have, I have 500 team members worldwide and uh, 40 of whom are in the U.S. are in not, well, we have U.S. offices, but in the headquarters, I should say, in the New York and San Francisco and we have a couple people in Singapore. That's the headquarters. And I'd say that office culture has been a little bit harmed by people being remote i'll be honest like you don't you miss the kind of water cooler you know conversations i agree however we've more than gained because the team of 500 is more connected than ever right mm -hmm. so i know exactly what's going on in you know colombia and south africa and vietnam i never knew and so i think the challenge is going to be how do we use these hybrid opportunities right how do we infer us we have these in-person selection panels it was great and it's fun and people are going to brazil and we're going to go to bali next year right and it's cool 
but yet in some ways it was hard. It was a barrier, right? And so having these online opportunities as well, especially for people to get to know one another, I find really, really useful. And but it's the combination. And I think that all of one and all of the other doesn't work. And I don't know, but I think we're gonna have to figure that, figure that out. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And and I um and I recognize that in, in a global context, uh maybe the access to technology is different. The access to internet and just how people communicate um, can be different depending on where people, where people are. You are well regarded um, as a leader, as an entrepreneur, and you framed and leveraged um, a multiplier effect to support in particular, you know, high impact entrepreneurs in ways that transform emerging economies. Um, I would like to first ask you to, to talk about that. Like, what is it like to develop something that's having such a transformational impact in a, in a local global way, like in a local way, but in a very mm -hmm. big way that touches so many people? Yeah, I look, I think that's been the most rewarding thing is that was our theory of change, right? <laughs> that, yeah. that you would have that role model effect that you would have the multiplier effect that you talk about. But, but in, in reality, what that means, and I always used to kind of joke with with back to Reed Hoffman of LinkedIn, he he was, um, you know, that we were gonna seed PayPal mafias in emerging markets, and he did not like the word mafia. And it's like, <laughs> you've got to say PayPal networks, PayPal networks. So I, so I joke, and I said last week, I was like, Reed, own the mafia, it's the mafia. And, but what's exciting is you now go to Latin America, where there were no, by the way, people were just starting out, there were nowhere to hire engineers. Back to, you know, Jeff, you mentioned you're an engineer. Who do you hire back, you know, to when you're the first startup, no one's had any experience. They've all worked for, you know, family offices or didn't have a job. So now you see a decade, two decades later, there's the Rappi Mafia. So Rappi is the first Colombian, you know, billion dollar company, the a super app. And now they're all starting, you know, the, the, the next generation of companies, right? If you go to Kareem, uh, the, the Middle East, Kareem sold Uber for $3 billion. Now, all the Kareem, you know, early employees are all starting companies throughout the Middle East and North Africa, right? You have some of the early um, fintech companies like InterSwitch and Arandela in Africa, and now you're seeing those mafias, Gojek and Grab in Southeast Asia. That's what's super exciting to me is that number one, it's that next generation, but they've been supported by that first generation. So rather than people sort of saying, if you leave me, you're dead to me, don't leave. They said, oh, I'll invest in your next company. I mean, that's what Silicon Valley did well, right? And so seeing people see that next group. And now um, I will say the next thing what's interesting is we're seeing finally more women in tech around the world. Um, and we're seeing a number come from, uh, We've had, we just had a fintech company in Nigeria, the superstar is a woman. We had the first unicorn company in Latin America led by female founder Hobby, um, a prop tech firm. And what I've been noticing in Saudi Arabia is that a lot of the current uh, tech firms, and it's only been about five years old that, by the way, anyone could even pay with credit cards in Saudi Arabia. It was all cash wow. on delivery, right? So you have these two guys, there's always two, it's always a pair, it's always a pair of guys. And I asked them, what percentage of your engineers are women? So tell me the answer. Who wants to guess what's the percentage of every, and it's every company in Saudi Arabia? Okay, zero. Jeffrey says zero. Any other guesses? Jennifer, guess. 2%. JC, 2%. JC says 2%. <laughs> Jennifer, you have a guess? Aisha, Stephanie? I'm going 40 to 60%. What? 40 to 60%. Every single one. Every single one. So I've told my managing director, who's a female entrepreneur, I've said, watch this space, that in the next few years, those 40 to 60% of female engineers are going to be starting the next companies. So that's what's exciting is like what's just under the surface is really, and they're getting, they get better and better in the next generation. So that's, that, that what's, that's, yeah, this was my idea in theory, right? That becomes like a reality that gets even more exciting. How do you find how to um, kind of cast that vision to people when, when they don't see it? Um, what are you saying with them? What are you describing to them 
uh, to get them to kind of buy in and jump in or at least not squander what's trying to begin to happen. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, Arbit, we used to have to convince the old guard, the old families to kind of bring Endeavor into their country. So what we appealed to was, hey, if you're going to do one thing, mentor the next generation that's not in your family. But what's great yeah. is that entrepreneurs get it. You don't really have to pitch it to them. It's just like, oh, my God, this is my thing. Like, I get it, right? And so I don't feel like I end up doing that. But I do think, you know, Sat I went after Satya Nadella of Microsoft was, um, was at this conference I was speaking at, and he went before me. And... One of the things she said resonated, which is today with people not deciding to go back in the office and with, you know, Gen Z and other things, she's like, you know what, the role of leaders is to provide energy and optimism. Hmm. And I was like, yeah, you know, yeah. I'll provide the energy and the optimism and, and no, back to what Jeffrey was saying, no, the people, right? But then it's, it's like for others to kind of bring their own story and bring their own thing. So I actually, that's what I find. I think if you're working too hard to convince people, they're probably not the right people. And that gets back to the board conversation we're having or team, right? I just sort of feel like that's, that's how I approach things. But Stephanie has a question. Yeah, Stephanie and then George. So uh, as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, in, in sort of the initial night, you know, of, you know, contemporary entrepreneurship, like say in the States, we've seen where, you know, the guys in the garages, you know, putting together book orders and computers have, have grown so large that they now um, are a counterforce to a dynamic marketplace and entrepreneurship. Um, with the entrepreneurship now happening globally, I mean, all, all of the things that you've been talking about are, uh, things that are kind of lively and making connections and uh, fluidity. Uh, what's to keep it from sort of taking the same course in terms of sort of the mega companies? Well, that I, I think that for starters, I think that the founders shares got a little out of control. And I think that for better or for worse, the founders in these markets do not have as much optionality. They don't dictate the terms. So for better or for worse, they're, the ownership is really first from the people coming in to give them right the funding. And then eventually if they do become public, you know, getting, getting um, boards of directors. I think when you're looking at a lot of the problems, if you look at, for example, Meta, what I mean, it's what what happened with Google? What happened with Google? Not only did they bring in Eric Schmidt, kind of a grown up, but Larry and Sergey were said, okay, go do this Google X thing. You want to do these crazy like cars or glasses? Go do Google. Why did no one say this to Mark Zuckerberg? Why did no one say you want to go to the metaverse? Don't screw with the company. Like go build your thing. Why? Because he controlled everything. Elon Musk just fired the board. He is the board of Twitter and right and brought in David Sachs, right? And 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 folks from A16Z. So I think that what I would say, Stephanie, is number one, I mean, it could happen, but I think that in these markets, because they don't have the power, they're just they're they're really in their motivations really aren't to create, as I said, this this it's it's this fun thing and to get it is really to solve these problems at scale, at least for now, right? Yeah. So they're really trying to connect, whether it's this, you know, e-fishery is connecting all, digitizing all the fisher, uh, you know, Indonesia has 17,000 islands and they're connecting all of the local fishermen and giving them access to markets. It's a huge market, but that's what, so I feel like right now there's a bigger purpose, but you're right, it could happen. It could happen. Um, but I think that, I think by the time these these founders are given, they're not going to be these mega, there's not going to be the founder shares and the control that we've seen that's created a lot of the issues. Thank you. Uh, George Nurberg has a question. Good question though. Uh, George, would you like to ask? I can also read your question. Uh, sure, I can go ahead and read it. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. perfectly. Great. Um, yeah, so. Um, Hi, everyone. I'm George. I was just curious. Yeah, I'm coming from the world of big tech, um, focused in software, but just curious more generally, like where is the need in the world of global social entrepreneurship? Is it leadership, um, you know, at a certain level? Is it uh, line managers? Is it people on the ground? Um, you know, I'm just looking for the next step in my career, and I'd love yeah. to be an entrepreneur myself one day, but, you know, curious if you think maybe the impact is, is better um, had elsewhere. 
Well, I think that's that 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 comes from within. What I would say is, I mean, I think that um, look, being an entrepreneur is hard. So the only reason to be an entrepreneur is if you can't be not be an entrepreneur, right? right? So, but I so I'd say if there's an idea that like that's what I love is I wait. You know, the people who are doing this every day in these really hard climates, it's like they can't stop, right? I was just with someone who is. Um, v, uh, the founder of Vtex, which went public last year from Brazil, and it's an e-commerce platform that's actually rivaling Amazon. And and he said we were the, one of the first. We and Nubank, they were one of the first Brazilian tech firms to become global and to go public on the Na in the on the Nasdaq. And he said, I can't fail. If I fail, all these Brazilians looking at me, they don't do it next, right? So that's what I would say is what motivates you. I mean, people, and what I would say is people want mentor mentorship. There's always opportunities, right? And 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 Stephen's plugging this, you know, this uh, leadership committee. There's boards. There's other. That's what I think you can do is if if you're not ready to do something full time, there's so many people who would love board members or tech advisors or um, or leadership coaches, right? Um, and so I think it's a question of whether you want you know what what's motivating you and is it a full-time thing or is it um a part-time uh, i can follow that up unless someone else has sure. a question um yeah so I, I see myself as having to be full-time at big tech just financially just given where i am in life um, with my partner um but you know maybe one day down the road i can dedicate myself to to starting a company when you say um, big so tech, I guess in the short what type of would... company what type of company if i could ask uh, yeah, probably a software based company. So I've tried starting a couple of ed tech companies in the past yeah. uh, that um, couldn't get off the ground. And so, yeah, I pivoted into software engineering to give myself the technical skill set to actually build something because mm -hmm. uh, software is the best tool I know of that can be scaled and distributed, you know, with just a single person. Um, so yeah, you I don't know. Scratch the that itch. I would domain. say, look, there's a lot of startup founders. If you if you do go to a global scale company, or when we have we have a lot of people who come from Am at, or who are ex Amazon or Facebook or Microsoft to end up spending a lot of time mentoring Endeavor entrepreneurs because they want to. They're they need to stay in their in their jobs or they've retired, but then the, but they've but they've built global scale companies and worked with founders, right? And so. There's a that that's that's an avenue where you can scratch the entrepreneurial itch without going kind of all got all in. Got it. Yeah, I think that's the key is I'd love to be, you know, helping people, whether it's through mentorship, coaching, um, leadership or on a board, but I, I haven't built, you know, a unicorn myself. And so I feel like, you know, that's probably step one. But I was curious, is that actually not a necessary step to to get into the world of global social entrepreneurship? No, and look, and I also think so. Look, for us, we define high impact as really high growth, but there's a lot of companies, and, and, and a number of ours are, as I said, all of them feel like they're having impact, but they're, but they're, they're growing as well. But there's also, you know, my friend Jacqueline Novogratz runs Acumen, and they're very clear that they are taking people who are solving problems, helping um, people who make less th than $3 a day. And so they're less focused on just the growth and they are doubling down on the impact. So I think within this whole range, there's so much going on that you can find, whether it's the more social side or the more growth side or the impact or any, something in between, there's probably an organization that I'm sure would love to, to have your talents. So let's say I'm, I'm hunting right now, where should I go? Is this a LinkedIn hunt for, or do you have a specific, I don't know, um, job posting or location where I could check these out? Um, well, go to LinkedIn, but our, you can check out our Endeavor site, which is there. You can check out Acumen, I mentioned, A-C-U-M-E-N. Um, Ashoka is more gonna be on the nonprofit social side. So there's the entire sort of spectrum. Um, and yeah, I can, I can figure out, I'll touch on Orlando and Steven if we have other sort of thoughts on places to go. Great. Yes. Right, thanks for sharing your resources and thanks for the answer. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, and George, important question. Thank you for, for asking it. Um, I'll read Elijah's question, then I'll ask Steve to speak, and then we will, right. we will transition. We are at the hour. Um, so Elijah asked a question, you know, what advice would you give to founders on protecting them from difficult personalities, uh, given startups involve a large number of personnel? Yeah, look, I don't think this is just for start for startups. I think this is true for all of us, right? As I said before, one of the reasons I love Yale, we have to, you know, being a leader has always been difficult. Going into the workforce is difficult and transitioning, right? And I think that, 
you have, I think that this idea that people will mold themselves to a corporate culture, like those days are over, mm -hmm. right? And I think that the world, even if the power balance, you know, shifted so much to the employees and now everyone says it's coming back, but no, no one's going back to the office five days a week working, you know, and now that you saw like, wait a minute, we can do some things from home. And similarly, no one I don't think is going to give over their whole selves to, uh, uh, you know, the corporation. My husband just wrote a book called The Search about searching, finding meaningful work in a post-career world, right? And we're all transitioning and pivoting and people leave jobs after two to three years. So I feel like it's the job of leaders and it's job of people to make different people and different personalities feel welcome. Different roles require different things. We're talking about engineers, right? Not everybody has to have the same bubbly outgoing personality. Like you've got to figure it out. Um, but I think that it's more important. I think a job of, of leaders today are harder because you really just can't say, sorry, if you're not X, Y, if you're not the you know extrovert with this personality, you're not describing for you. No, you can't do that anymore. So I think that we just have to all keep, as I said, learning and growing and being um, attuned to the fact that uh, you know the porous boundaries also between home and work are, are you know are gone. And so you have to accept people for their full selves, including all the challenges and issues they bring in their family and personal lives too. And that's just part of being a, a successful leader going forward. Thank you very much, Steve. Yeah, thank you very much. And I know we're at the top of the hour. I'll, I'll try to be quick. Um, first, a comment uh, to something George had asked. Um, we do have as our um, community building platform at Yale cross campus. And George, I can see that you've joined cross campus. I did that just while we were on the call. It's that easy to do. Um, remember that on cross campus, our very largest group on cross campus is called Entrepreneurship and Innovation has 1,100 Yaleys that are members, a mix of alums and students. Wow. You stir that pot, you're gonna find a lot of good, good stuff. So um, just another place to go since you're already on cross campus. Um, there's also mentorship on cross campus as, as I think many people on this call know, we pair 1,500 alums with 1,500 students uh, each semester. And there's some reverse mentorship that can go on there too. Mm -hmm. So just a comment. The big question for you, Linda, um, which is actually riffing away from where we've been, is you know Yale pretty well. I mean, you know the Yale board. Yeah. You're, you're, you're uh, circling at very high levels at Yale, to be blunt. And um, what would you like to see Yale do in the global arena more than it is? Hmm. That's a great question. I think that Yale... Um, you know, in some ways it punches above its weight in so many things. And I think the benefit of, of, of being so interdisciplinary and you see what, you know, what's happening in, in Ukraine with Tim Snyder, or you see what's happening with global health with, you know, the COVID with analyzing, right? The Yale folks were the first to analyze the, uh, the sewage water and figure out where, where, where COVID was. I mean, yeah, I mean, Yale, people are doing so many things and yet I think to amplify right what's 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 happening and to show in, in my view these interdisciplinary cross disciplinary um, you know uh, 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 success stories and I will say you know Jeffrey mentioned I, I don't understand why the School of Management doesn't have a bigger brand that's a big pet peeve of mine um i spent a lot of time on mba campuses and i think what you what heather gherkin's done with the law school is incredible and her goal is to attract people who would go to stanford business school or harvard business school to the law school and the law school's always had a great brand i thought the school management is great and i i, I don't understand why it doesn't do more to amplify especially where it also has always talked about organizational behavior it's always talked about management in the public and private sector, all the things that are kind of du jour now and dealing with the environment and other things. And so that's sort of one area that I feel like it could could amplify because it's sort of business leadership and tech and you know in, in, in a different viewpoint than just the traditional HBS kind of or uh, or tech focused uh, way. So that's well, thank you for that. Well, that's, that's, that's a, ever, I was gonna say Linda, insight. if you ever want to do something the uh, you know, email, receipt email, maybe do something at SLM. I'd love to do that. Yeah, I'm actually going to bring uh, three of our Sunicorns. Um, one, so actually, uh, Song Laurent, I mentioned him from Squire, Peter and Jonjo of Twiga, the um, ag tech company from Kenya, 
and a woman named Mona Ataya, who created Mum's World, a large e-commerce story out of uh, Dubai based off our mothers and children. I'm bringing them to SOM for the, uh, pre the collo Dean's Colloquium on Entrepreneurship on February 8th. Excellent, good. If I can be of any help, let me know. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you, Linda. I wanna ask um, if you could give us your, your closing thought or comment, uh, any thought or comment for us who are here or advice that you would share with Yaleys who want to become business people or entrepreneurs who lead positive change. Uh, any closing thought for us? Well, one thing I would say is just, you know, learning to do something global. If you can spend time in another culture, the world, as I said, seems so depressing these days. And it's amazing when you're going to these places and the optimism, you know, we have Ukrainian founders that are coming, right? And it's just, it's just, it's so um enriching and i think that uh, one of the reasons one of the ways i've gotten involved with yale is through this president's council of international activities and yale in africa and yale in um doing things it was doing the singapore campus which is you know no longer but i think what they're doing in brazil and and in africa and in the rest of the country they're it's really trying to bring sort of this this liberal arts thinking to to the world and then learning and bringing back the great things that are going on on these uh, in these other places, you know, to uh, to New Haven and to all of our lives. So that's that's what I would say is uh, the more global you can be. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world, and what's exciting is you know the innovation. I believe that just as in the first generation of things, everyone would be you know the Amazon of X or the Google of Y or the Uber of Z or the Alibaba of you know of a Q. Now you're going to start to say, you know, as George was saying, ed tech, the top ed tech companies are not coming from the U.S. They're going to be imported back here. Right? We're seeing you know, first generation ideas happening outside that are going to be transported here. So that's the other thing I would say is let's, you know, in the U.S. we always think we, we, you know, we start everything, but I think there's a lot of really great ideas happening at scale that we can um, bring back, bring back to our own lives and work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, thank you for this, this rich conversation um, on global entrepreneurship and your personal and professional journey. So thank you for leading us in conversation tonight. Uh, thank you to our students, alumni, guests who are here, uh, the Yale Alumni Association staff. Thank you in particular, uh, Board of Governor members. We thank you. Um, the Careers Life and Yale shows every Thursday. Um, and so we thank you very much for for being here and the chat is there. Um, so Great. thank you very much everyone tonight. Uh -huh.